And there we go. Hope you enjoyed that, everyone. Welcome to Conversations of the Institute. Uh, my name is George Myers. I'm the president of Effectiveness Institute, and I've been the host for these conversations, including today's conversation with John Chen, who I'll introduce you in just a minute. These conversations were exploring the topic of how behavior styles, something behavior styles, uh, something the Effective Institute does a lot of work in, um, how um, that relates to cultural and racial bias, specific areas of our shared life together. Uh, these are dynamics I've been interested in for a long time and uh, where I've seen powerful connections with all the uh, current social activity around racial inequity in our country, uh, starting, of course, with George Floyd most, most recently in uh, Kenosha, even more recently than that. Um, I was inspired to write a blog about these connections, behavior styles and culture and bias. And uh, you'll find that blog post, by the way, on our website, along with an excellent blog post by our guest, John Chen, as well. My goals are very simple. Uh, I want to have conversations where I can listen and learn from others about the behavior style models that relates to culture and racial bias, things I'm very interested in and want to learn more about, and also want to be involved in, uh, in changing and improving. I also want to invite others into the conversation, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, by the way, one comment on the opening music you heard, I've been uh, watching the epic Ken Burns series on jazz lately, and reminded about how jazz is very American, very multi-layered, very universal, often improvisational, and uh, with roots in the African-American communities of New Orleans with some American and European sensibilities. I think that just makes a very perfect motif uh, for which to think about uh, these conversations I'll be having, including today's. So one note, if you're invited, if you, you are invited, by the way, to send questions to us anytime, just send it in the Zoom chat. We'll get those to you, uh, we'll answer those questions as we go along as much as we can, and definitely by the end as well too. So. Uh, before I introduce John to you briefly, I want to give you a little overview, a quick overview of the behavior style model I mentioned before to you, that we do a lot of work in, just so you know what we mean by behavior styles here. So let me go ahead and come on back to my screen here and share this with you here. When we talk about behavior styles in, at the Institute, we use the metaphor of an iceberg because it does a real good job explaining what we mean by behavior styles. Now, there's a lot that goes into who we are and our personality. Certainly our birth order, our, um, our family of origin, our ethnicity and our race, uh, gender, age, life experiences, neurological makeup, many things shape who we are. We acknowledge those are all very important and very real. There's a part of our personality that's a little bit different than the majority of who we are. It's the part of us that people observe, the observable behavior part of our personality. And that's a bit unique uh, than the rest of the personality, the part below the waterline, because the part above the waterline is a choice meaning we can change our behavior by choice when we need to situationally. And we, I think we can all do that very quickly when we need to. Uh, so we summarize that by saying personality is really about who we are. Behavior is about what we do. Now, of course, behavior is connected to personality. It's a part of the personality, but it's different than the majority of who we are because most of who we are does not change situationally, intentionally, and temporarily by choice. Certainly our personality can change, no question, but not situationally, intentionally, intentionally and temporarily where the, the part below the waterline can change, um, excuse me, the part above the waterline, the behavior, that can change situationally, intentionally, and temporally by choice. For example, uh, we behave a certain way because we're comfortable doing that, but it's still a choice. You know, I know for myself, if I'm having a conversation with somebody that's very serious one-on-one, -on -one, I would rotate my iceberg, as we say at the B Institute, I'd behave a bit differently. And if I was working on a task that had an urgent deadline, I'd behave a, a bit differently there as well. If I was proving a document that required a lot of attention to detail, I'd also behave differently. But all these different ways I could behave, I would tend to want to get back to a certain way I like to behave, okay? Because that's more of my comfort level. Uh, that's what we call behavior style, those patterns of behavior. These patterns of behavior I described to you, notice, not patterns of personality. The personality still is there. It's very significant, but it's mostly below the waterline. People don't see that part of us. But based on the situation environments we find ourselves in, sometimes we modify our behavior. Now, briefly in the models we talk about here, there are two simple lines of behavior. How do you go about getting things done? We do both sides of this line. We can be expedient, we can be process and how we go about accomplishing things. Uh, we talk about emotions. How do you engage with people? Are you more emotionally controlled or responsive? Like you, I do both sides of these lines. So I do all sides of these lines. When we're being emotionally controlled and expedient results focused, we call that the controller behavior style. All of us do that to some degree, some simply more than others. 
when we're being expedient, the responsive, we're showing what we call a persuader style. Again, we all do that behavior. Some simply do it more comfortably than others do, more often. When we're being processed on results, but we're being more responsive with our, uh, with our emotions, we're showing the stabilizer style. And when we're being processed on results, but we're being controlled emotionally, we're showing the analyzer style. That's a simple, quick review of the behavior style model. Again, we do all of these behaviors situationally. Uh, so that's the behavior style model, which again, I've seen these powerful connections between that model and, uh, and cultural connections. So let me go ahead and explore the topic today with you, with our, with our guests. Very excited to have John with us. John Chen is the virtual leader of geoteaming. <laughs> He's been virtually uh, meeting for over 35 years, the author of Engaging Virtual Meetings, by the way, a new book, 50 Digital Team Building Games, games a top-selling business book. There it is right there. It's a great book, great resource. His work has earned, has earned him multiple awards, more than 230 client, 30,000 clients across the world. In addition to leading geoteaming, he climbs mountains, he walks on fire, he swims with dolphins in the wild, he rides Harleys, he organizes Super Bowl suites while meeting with people from around the world from his computer. Uh, I tell you, I'm just thrilled to have you here, John, and talk with you about the subject matter. So welcome, my friend. Thank you so much, George. It's an honor to be here. I'm so glad. Last time you and I talked, we talked about psychological safety. This yeah. topic, I think, is even more important. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Important topic, but this is very important right now. And I, obviously, as you know, I'm very compelled uh, by the subject matter. It's very important to me, uh, which is the one reason why I engage in these conversations. Tell us a little more about yourself, though, John. Tell more about yeah. you. Thanks, George. Uh, my hometown is Stockton, California. Uh, and it's a very small town, you know, it's like uh, out of uh, San Francisco, but had some challenges, right, in terms of race uh, in that, that city. Uh, then I went to UC Santa Barbara, which is like a, a whole different, you know, a cultural bias uh, where we can kind of say dude, and we really mean both males and females. Um, so I graduated there with a degree in computer science. I came up here, worked for that little software company uh, next to your office, uh, Microsoft. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I worked there for 10 years, shipped 10 products. I got two US patents. And then I really found wow. a thing that I'm really passionate around. Uh, I always had this question, George, and I know questions are powerful for you. Uh, yep. I always knew there was something I was supposed to do. I just don't know what it is. And <laughs> I had a coach like kind of like you, and he came up and he's, he's the only person who says, give me a weekend and I'll tell you exactly what it is. And so I formed this company and it's around technology. It's around team building that uses technology and adventure. This is my 23rd year of doing it. I've been in uh, Seattle now, geez, was it 30 years now? This is my 30th year in, in, um, in Seattle and uh, that's what I'm doing now. And so, you know, the funny part here too, what, you know, a little bit about myself, why am I doing this now? Um, 20 years ago, we experimented with technology uh, using webcams and saying, I think people can actually build trust on there. And that's kind of like when the light bulb went on. Uh, we tried to sell it over the last 20 years and people were like, ah, that sounds interesting, but let's just buy that face-to-face -face thing. <laughs> right. In March, George, people got interested again. Yeah, right. Something changed in March. Huh? Something changed. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's a little bit about me. Well, and I met you, John, back when I joined the Institute 14 years ago. You were working with Sharon Andrade, one of our sales execs at the time. And, and I was fascinated by what you were doing, as you probably remember. But of course, many years went by and I kept thinking about wanting to connect with you. But then about a year ago, we formed this partnership between Geoteaming and the Institute because we'd done some work together for a while there, which was, uh, which was a lot of fun. I got to experience more about what you do. And you got certified, of course, in our behavior style model. So you know that very well. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward to being able to switch gears a bit here and talk about this topic here. Uh, let me ask you the question. What was it like for you growing up Asian American in the US? John, what was that like for you? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> I want to jump right into the pool, man. Okay, let's jump in the deep end, right? It's like, uh, yeah. well, I was a yeah. small boy in Stockton, California. And in Stockton, yeah. California, it was dominated. We were way on the west side of town by the 4-H club. So there was definitely a lot of country in, in our town. And uh, I was one of not too many Asians there. And mm -hmm. I definitely remember uh, growing up and having to deal uh, with racism uh, at my schools, uh, you know, walking around. Uh, it wasn't apparent all the time, but it was definitely there enough that mm -hmm. when you grow up and you kind of get that part going, People look at you different. You, you know, George, they kind of always make that joke, right? You're not from around here, are you? Right, right? Yeah, yeah. But I said, like, I live here. What are you talking about? Right, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. so, yeah, I've had that. I think there are, you know, Seattle's actually has, I think, one of the more difficult versions, which is people definitely aren't outright in their racism here. Mm -hmm. 
but there's a very sometimes very small undertone which we can talk a little bit later around it which is really hard to detect it's almost harder i'd rather have people just be out with it right if you're not going to like me yeah, right 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 so much easier than i'm like oh okay great yeah, but the ones that are really <laughs> yeah. tricky are like people who look like your friends uh, and they're not but mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. uh, yeah so i did grow up with, with racism i think it's a big topic and it's something that i've dealt with and spent energy like you so i appreciate you george you're taking use we you have this amazing stat right and that yeah. you took action because there's a lot of people who aren't they're like i don't know what to do yeah. or they're just not doing it, right yeah the uh the, the set you mentioned there i came across as i was having a conversation actually with uh with uh dr carrie spiel hansen uh, an african-american woman on the on the west east coast that we're mm. starting to do some partnering with around dei and she shared this npr article john that you kind of alluded to uh, this is what I found on NPR recently, uh, everyone. Since the death of George Floyd in May, the question was by NPR, have you personally taken any actions to better understand racial issues in America? And I got to admit, folks, I was shocked to find that the answer of whites was 30%. That was all. Just and look that around. to me is mortifying to think that that's, that's, that's it, folks. Come on, we can do better than that. My goodness gracious. So so that was just horrifying to me and very sad, actually. Real grief to me to find that's the case. So let's just go around, right? People who are joining us from all over, thank you so much to Dana yeah, Pratt from Portland, Beth, uh, Hong Chur, who's always been an advocate, Curtis from Black Dot, uh, let's see, Bonnie, Julian. And, and if you just did the stats, right? Like one out of three, if you look around the room, you look at three people, only one of them has done something. Something, yeah, something. I mean, that's all, just something. So yeah, that's that's and that's of course one reason why we're having these conversations because I, I want to continue to do what we can to influence people, to encourage people that hey, engaging this is not only important, but it's okay. We need to do this. We have to do this work. This is an important work for us to do as a nation, as a country, for ourselves as well. So I'm curious to know, John, when we had conversations, you talked about the bamboo ceiling. Would you tell yeah. me a little more about that? Have you have you experienced that? Uh, yeah, but before I tell you, I'm just going to help reiterate this message because I know how streaming works. If you're going to turn the stream off, listen to this one thing. Do something. Yes, Get into that 30 percent. Take that 30 percent, 100 percent. Do absolutely. something. Anything. That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. Read a book, for goodness sake. Something. <laughs> yeah. Anything. All right. Yeah. Watch Anyways. a conversation. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, let's Agreed. go back to the. Um, you're here. You're I, here. I spent a lot of my corporate uh, time at Microsoft. And when people ask me, uh, I didn't think so, but I, I think I did. And here's what happened. Um, I was actually one of the fast risers there. Imagine yeah. that, George. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no <laughs> and and uh, so and I got to a certain level, but when it came to the, like the management levels, it was really difficult. Um, you know, uh, I think there's only been one or two really, really high ranking, at least at the time when I was there, there was only one. There was only one Asian American who was in the VP level. I know that has gotten better, uh, yeah. but it's still not representative of the audience. And so mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I hit a ceiling. And uh, so so the, actually, this is a good stat too, George. So one of our organizations that you and I do a lot of work with is Executive Development Institute. And what they found out that um, uh, is that even though Asian Americans have 200% the national average in education, like a, a bachelor's degree and above, we still only have a 50% or less chance of having a job, uh, an executive job in a government, nonprofit, or a corporation. 50%. Yeah. I, so is, yeah. Yeah. You, those statistics, it's kind of like it's, 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 it's the, the people that are in the, in the country that still think racism is not a problem at all. I think, well, okay, there's many other statistics. We can quote a lot of them, but it's hard to hear that statistic and not say, well, there seems to be a problem there, right? I mean, it seems that obvious. <laughs> to me, it certainly does anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Houston, Houston, we have a problem. Hello. Yeah, absolutely. Not 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 rocket science here, folks, right? Um well, so and wait, let me just add this piece too, George. Yeah. yeah. Right. For me, mm -hmm. right, I could have tried to fight the route, but it just didn't seem. And it's so funny. When I decided that I was gonna start my own company and mm -hmm. I said I can break this stat by cheating. Okay quote unquote cheating, which is right, yeah. start my own company, because then I immediately get into the executive yep. level, yep. right? Only yep. then did I can, and I'll give a shout out to a, a, one of my managers, Hal Howard started then asking me, hey, do you want to like, you know, follow my steps, get promoted? And I had to tell him no. And like six months later, I told him, and then I dropped my business plan on his desk. And I said, uh -huh. I really appreciate that you yeah. right, were willing to give me a chance. I just want to yeah. tell you, you were actually too late. But and why I didn't <laughs> yeah. accept. I, I, so I told them too specifically, please keep asking other people for mm -hmm. me. Here's why I didn't say mm -hmm. didn't say yes. It wasn't about you. It was about me. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the, the stories that I, I had last month, I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Kendra Washington Bass from Gwinnett County Public Schools. Um, uh, amazing, uh, difficult, amazing conversations, but mostly because of the, just how like opening the eyes. Like I said, John, one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because I want to listen and learn. Yeah. So I, I appreciate your talking and sharing your story with me about this. Let me let me do a little bit of a pivot here in behavior style. because That was kind of the, the impetus for this in our company, because as, as I mentioned, I saw a lot of connections. And you obviously know our behavior style model. You're certified in it, uh, use it many places too. What, what connections have you seen behavior, behavior styles and culture and possible bias? Can you talk a little bit about that with us? Well, I just want to give you this first piece, George. Yeah. Was rotating your iceberg on your 2020 bingo card? <laughs> Should be everything else is there, right? Duracho, Fire Absolutely. NATO. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. That's a good uh, one. <laughs> behave yourself too. And so, you know, I'm really excited around this too because, uh, George, I've been following this work and I have actually integrated into my programs. And so, when you know the behavior styles of your teammates, you can adjust your team to bring out its greatest resources. Right. Mm -hmm. And quite often we see that teams, we, we have done this on purpose. George has seen me do this. We have aligned a team of all controllers yep, sure on is. a team. Yeah. Right. And, and they, they did in the first part of my program, they did what we suspected most of them would yep. do, which is they, it's too many cooks in the kitchen. They were all yep. fighting with each other. Absolutely. But yep. at lunch, we saw this great conversation emerge. And then these controllers all rotated different styles for each of them. And they came out, they went from last place to first place. And yep. And George, what, what a, one of the other things that happens inside of here too is by knowing this style, George actually watched video, right? Uh, but when I was, I video all my events. So we're doing video analysis of this team and George is looking at these teams and they're speaking Mandarin. And by the way, George, unfortunately does not speak Mandarin, neither do I. Uh, yeah, no, nope. <laughs> a few words, a few words, that's all. She said. But he's, he's picking up everything off of body language and his 20 plus years or probably more, uh, right, of, of that and identifying styles. He doesn't even need to know, right? He's like, oh, that person's a persuader, that person's a controller, that person's an analyzer. He was able to pick the winning team out of just watching these videos. And that's what I'm saying is, is you know, where can these behavior styles benefit you? Yeah. I think it's awareness is nine tenths of the battle, George, especially in, in racism. Yeah. You've got to think of like when we go to another country, right? We shouldn't come as the terrible, right? American oh, tourists, like trying to classic. say, where's the McDonald's instead of saying, yeah. can you show me where the baguette is? Can I see, mm -hmm. you know, what, can I try mm -hmm. some, you know, something of this culture? And um, yep. uh, that's where it is. And so in reference Absolutely. to Asian cultures, one of the things is you and I did a lot of work with uh, with Chinese airlines. Mm hmm. And in Chinese airlines, statistically and behaviorally, we saw uh, more of them being analyzers and stabilizers. So let me see if I can do my 10 cents on it and then yep. the master will, will yeah. give the color commentary. <laughs> right? Analyzers are people who love numbers and they like make the decisions. They're usually reserved, they usually wait, they look at all their you know, options right. uh, and, and then, they, then they contribute. All right? Stabilizers mm -hmm. are people who are looking like, how do we smooth this out? How do we not have conflict, right? Can I facilitate a decision that makes everybody happy? Yep. And, and each of these can be really, really valuable. And you can see sometimes how, if we stereotype Asian culture, how people might have these styles. And yep. I think that's important for them to know because then in Asian Americans, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to my very good friend, Jolene Jang. And she was on my birthday call, which George was, was briefly on. And yeah. she said, oh my gosh, I have still not met another Asian like you, which is like, we're part of the extroverted persuader. I, right, okay, exactly, you didn't guess, yeah. Nobody yeah. guessed in the chat. Oh, wait a minute. Holy cow. Kimberly, uh, you get a gift from South Bend, Indiana. She guessed that I was persuader. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah, yeah that's right that's right you're breaking you're breaking you're breaking the stereotype john good <laughs> that's the point there's some people like that that's you know the the thing that even blew me away is that yeah. i met people from the beijing region where my grandparents yeah. grew up and they were tall yeah right like right. seven foot tall right yeah yeah what yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, here growing up in America, I was like, oh, you're short, right? And like oh, my son yeah. is like in the one percentile of height. Yeah, he, he yep. is short. But yep. <laughs> uh, and so yeah. that's where I think that's where the behavior styles, I think, relate in Asian cultures. Like some yeah. of us in Asian cultures have to work harder for for to get to the controller and persuader. And I think that's what hurts us in American style management, which yep. is. American style management is about kind of who can take control, who could be the loudest, who can speak or orate well. Yep. And sometimes Absolutely. culturally, oh, yeah. that's not our best suit. No, no. In fact, when I, in fact part, of what, part of my inspiration around this was many, many years ago when I was in China doing some work, 
I asked the group that was I teach, I was teaching behavior styles to, to raise their hands based on what style they thought they were. And the fascinating point, John, was when I asked, how many of you feel like the persuader? This is what I saw. Now imagine this. All the students that had a persuader went like this. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, look at that. I mean, that's like just it just it, it, in my brain, it was like, aha, I just had the insight. That's not okay to be that style here. So I then I started to wonder, what are the implications for this across across all these different levels, right? Yeah, and, and you're born with that. I mean, this is like a lot of the things that are in there. This is the culture. When we talk about culture, yeah. these are things that are grown up that you come with and that, uh, again, sometimes they help you in the right situations, but sometimes when they hurt you, you have to work really, really hard to gain that skill if you want to move forward and succeed in a culture that is not yours. Yeah, and, and I appreciate what you mentioned too, that you talked about, you know, that when we travel, we don't go with a stereotype in mind. We go trying to learn what's going on there because there, the, because whatever the culture is, there's a reason for it. I mean, we, we, know, we, we know you can't understand a culture until you know the language. You can't really know a culture until you know the language, right? And, and that's really true too as well. So I think when we go with the idea of learning, which is of course, of course what we're doing in these conversations is about that. Uh, learning about that too. So I think, you know, I, when I travel, I always try to, I always try to listen and learn and learn and hear just like we're doing right here. Because I, again, I think if we as Americans engage in our own culture around learning about other cultures in our culture and about th their perceptions and how they view things, what they experience, then we can learn more about that. And, and you've obviously seen, you know, biases in other Americans. You've experienced those growing up. Would you tell us a little more about what you've seen uh, and other people in terms of bias, a little bit about that. I'd love to know more about that, what you've seen and heard. Well, you bring to me one of the key pieces, uh, Larry Lesoto is a, a diversity trainer here in Seattle, and he has one of the greatest experience. Listen to this. He wrote a book about 10 people who were white supremacists who have changed. Mm, wow, powerful. 10 stories. Do you know what every wow. story has in common, wow. George? I'm curious. They made a friend. Oh, yeah, yep. Yep. They made a friend in one of the yep. groups that was not yep. white supremacy, like, you know, LGBTQ yep. or Asian yep. or black or, or, you know, whatever, Saudi. Yep. Uh, yep. And as soon as they made a friend, they suddenly, you know, they they understood. And so if you think you have a bias, if you want to take an action, take the time to become a friend and not a fake friend. Like I'm no, trying to no. do this to like right. punch my card. No. So I so agree. like, you know, it, George and I have talked a lot about George Floyd too. And, and things that I have done that I'm very proud about is that I've been working with a place called Urban Impact Seattle. Mm -hmm. We've been coaching entrepreneurs for a Great year. Great organization. 12, yeah. 12 Great of the or entrepreneurs, uh, like the stats is like 40% of black owned businesses are, might be bankrupt by next year. Yeah. But these 12 entrepreneurs yeah. are not only surviving, they're thriving. Yeah. And I had a small piece in that. Mm -hmm. And I feel very proud about that. And I've, uh, they've become my friends, right? And, and again, because they know that I'm just trying to help them. We're trying to help me. We're learning together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, to me, that's what's made a difference. Um, yeah. So I've that's seen, what, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, talking about doing something, do that. I, I've seen, I've seen the way that you inhabit this too, John, in terms of how you interact with and how you kind of inhabit the whole idea of what we're talking about here today. And that's one of the reasons why I'm having a conversation because I really got to tell you, I really admire it. I, to me, I think you really, you really do a great job of engaging with this very thing, even as someone who has dealt with the challenges of bias being against you. And to me, that's, that's always inspirational. In fact, I, I, I was just talking yesterday with this, 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 uh, this, uh, this uh, partner I've been building this relationship with and uh, about, about this topic matter, this subject matter. And I talked about how for me, um, my, my admiration for uh, African Americans in this country is great because they they have suffered and dealt with injustice in ways I can't begin to understand, and I think that's where it's like when you when you have that sense of humility to learn and appreciate that hey you know what and, and I've experienced I've experienced bias when I've traveled I've experienced negative and positive bias both, and so I know that's there and of course it's here as well but I think that when you just simply have a sense of humility to step into this place and go. What can I learn? What can I discover here? That makes a big difference. And you do a great job with that, by the way, I got to tell you. So I admire how you show up in those places, man. So Well, well, thank you for that. You know, it's funny. Yeah. I went to uh, Debrina uh, Gandy Jackson's Black Money um, uh, program. It was a conference when we could actually meet face to face. Remember that, George? I and uh, yeah. I was the only Asian there. Right. Wow. 
And, and wow. I said, you know, like talk about rotating your iceberg or feeling, yeah. you know, maybe potentially uncomfortable because, you know, yeah. you're the only one. But yeah. I, I yeah. felt comfortable because I knew people there and I, I want I'm there to support. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so this yeah. gets me the, the, this great term, George, if you haven't heard this before. Right. This is a, this is called Blasian power. OK. Oh, Blasian. Right. OK. OK. Right? When, when black and, and Asians collaborate and they have been collaborating ah, for years oh. in many, many different ways. Yeah. Uh, one nickname for that is Blasian power. And um, yeah, that's what I, I can say is, again, try to get into those experiences and be invited and be helpful and and do it. You know, the hard part is, too, I've heard George, too, is, is they're finally getting some guidelines, too, which is don't try and take over. Either. No, no, exactly. For once, like, you know, most of us who are used to being leaders and stepping up, and I know you need that to even get there. But yeah. when, when you get there, just to hang out and wait, yeah, absolutely. And wait for somebody to ask you to do something. Don't don't try and take over because I think that's yeah. it's their culture right? in, in those cases and that you yeah. you're the visitor and you need to I liken it to to visiting foreign countries. And by the way, if that's one thing that you want to do in terms of like learn less bias is is when we can safely travel. I have learned yeah. you and I have learned so much from international travel, things that mm -hmm. we would have never thought about because you got to get into somebody else's life and somebody else's culture. Absolutely. And the way to do it and think about it like that is to prepare yeah. is to yeah. learn something about that culture. And then when you get in, absolutely learn it slowly and, and, and find ways to experience it uh, yeah. and, and ask as opposed to like trying to put your own culture on top, top of somebody else's culture. So absolutely. Um, one of my powerful experiences I can briefly share when I was traveling to the Middle East uh, the first time uh, and I got was uh, I got to the airport late because I landed late. My flight was late. I'd never been there before. I was a little nervous. It was during it was during the time of a lot of people in the in the uh, Middle East with the U.S. being involved. I was a little nervous, of course, understandably. Never been there before, but my flight was so late. My luggage didn't arrive. Uh, my ride was not there. They'd gone. It was already it was like twelve. It was like after midnight. And I thought, oh my gosh, here I am alone in a Middle Eastern country. Uh, I don't know the language. I don't know what's going on. And there was a, a they said, well, they got to take a cab to your hotel. So I got in the cab. This guy is driving down these streets. I have no idea where my luggage is, where I am, what's going on. And I'm thinking, George, pay attention. Can you imagine how you feel? Imagine what other people feel. Pay attention to this feeling. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, yes. it is. Okay. Well, then you can have empathy for people when they feel uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Get it. So again, I think, like you said, too, you travel, just pay attention, be aware, listen, learn. Don't come in like you know, or don't come in as the touristy thing. Just come in and listen and learn. Because if you pay attention, you get a lot out of it. You get a lot out of it. You do those experiences. So you've probably had experiences too, I'm sure, where you've had learning moments as well. Do you have, do you have any particular learning moments you could share with us that kind of real powerful ones for you that you've had either traveling or even here in the US? Uh, well, if you don't mind, I'm actually gonna share uh, the story about my grandfather. Is that all right? I don't mind at all, totally, you bet. Yeah. So the reason why this story is so important this is this is part of my family's culture. And by the way, it was a, a me and Hong. Thank you so much. They were they were all there. Uh, Hong actually said, I definitely had those moments where an organization has made an uh, opportunity available to me as I'm heading out the door. You're too late, <laughs> evil. Yeah. Too late. Anyways. Yeah. So but but talking about this, my grandfather's stories is so important because like these are hot topics now. Immigration mm -hmm. is a hot topic. And so allow me to share this story. Let's see if you. I can get this just to work. But Ta-da! Oh, look at this. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> okay. cool. wow. This is a story about paper sun. If you know what a paper sun is, I know all you people here on Zoom and on um, Facebook Live uh, say yes. Chat yes if you do and no if you don't. So what is a paper sun? So as I do that, let's move along. Yeah. This is my grandfather. Um, and so his name is uh, Wong Wa Gum, right? Uh, me and our family, we called him Ang Ang. And by the way, this is actually a digital scan of his wedding certificate. Um, he came from a very poor village and it's called the Lung Tao Wan. Uh, it's called Dragon Head Turn. If you look, the mountains here are the back ridge of, mm -hmm. a, of a dragon and that the head, the river is the head of the turn is where the dragon's oh, head okay. is supposed to be. Okay. So yeah, things okay. like that are in Asian culture. Everyone's always yeah. looking like, where's the animal? Where's the thing like that? Yeah. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, well, by, the way, you, by the way, can I ask? Can I ask? Where's that relation to the? Because uh, I've been to uh, Qingmeng Dao, which is where the where the dragon uh, where, the, where the end of the wall is at. Where is this in relation to that, John? Oh, not no. The, it's a uh, Guangzhou, right? Guangzhou. So near Thank Hong you. Kong. Gotcha. Right? Okay. Gotcha. Thank um. You. So he was poor, and he was also orphaned. So talk about um challenges. 
he was orphaned as a as a small child and so um he he didn't he, he was not rich so let's uh, thank you song no barb no even hong chur right hong chur is in pr and communications uh, used to be at the opera and even he says no so good so so like this like george said listen and learn let's all right exactly uh, for those of you who know about the Chinese Immigration Act of 1888, go ahead and chat yes or no. Um, so the problem is that there was a law called the Chinese Immigration Act. So George, have you ever heard about this? I actually have, yeah, from you actually. Yeah, so in this case, uh, imagine that. Uh, it's like 1888, they thought all the Chinese people were taking all the railroad jobs. So the right. way they did it was passed a law. Right. Yep. And so yep. this is, I think, the first law that um, discriminated against a race. Uh, and I know that that slavery is in there. There's some distinction that's around there. But I think this is because it's uh, uh, this type of immigration law. Anyways, uh, definitely one of the first that it hit a whole race. Uh, they, thousands of people were definitely coming in for jobs. And this limited it to only 106. Right. Now, there's a loophole on the law. And the loophole says if you're the son of a, of a merchant, a business person, then you can get in. And the reason why is they, they were trying to keep the lower uneducated people out. So instead that the, they were trying to um, uh, say that, oh, well, if you're educated, then you know, okay, we'll let you in. So this is San Francisco. Yeah, so you remember this 1906, or at least, you know, I've heard or read about this. Yep, absolutely, yep. Great, great earthquake comes in because everything's yep. so close to each other. They crack the grass lines, they burn everything. And guess, George, get George, guess what important building they burn. Hey, there we go, okay. <laughs> so they, the records, where the records they, were kept. They burned, yeah, they burned the um, the courthouse and the courthouse yeah. contained all the birth records. And so afterwards they said, hey, anybody after the fires come, we're, we're rebuilding our birth records. Um, uh, if you had kids, could you come back in? And so uh, basically uh, they came in there and every Chinese business guy was like, yeah, I got five sons. I got six sons. Yeah, right, sure. So that's why they're called paper sons. Oh, they were invented. Wow. wow. Because with this important birth certificate, you can yeah. now get into the country. Wow. Right. Hmm. So they actually sold them and they sold them on a, on a market. And um, wow. there was um, uh, was a, it was like 100 bucks a year. So my, my grandfather was uh, 20 years old. So it cost him two grand of 1912 to 1916 money. That's a lot. Oh, that's a lot of money. Wow. Right. And so and so uh, uh, his uncle, because he was adopted, sold a third of his farm gambling on him. Right. Uh, and so and my grandfather was expected, of course, kind of pay him back with some interest or something like that. But, you know, it's a family loan. So mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. what happened was, is that, yeah, so you have to memorize all these facts. So, George, let me just ask you some questions about your house. How many windows does your house have? Uh, Twenty one. Do you have pets? No. Uh, do you have stairs? Yes. How many stairs are there from the first, second the floor? Eight. The reason why these questions are all important, because that's what happened, is that when you arrived, uh, you had a boat trip. Right. And you had all these fictitious facts about this family that you're actually not really part of, George. Three days before you get here on the boat, you have to throw off the book because you can't be caught with it. Otherwise, you're. Oh, cheating. yeah. Oh, my God. And you go to Angel Island. And on Angel Island, the first thing you're greeted by is guys in white lab coats separating the men from the women from the children. They don't speak Mandarin. Wow. wow. That's your first. Thing. And by the way, the color white for Chinese culture is the, culture, the color of a ghost. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah, they were doctors. They were quarantining the people, but they spoke nothing. And so wow. people got off the boat and they were totally disoriented. Welcome oh, to yeah. America. Oh, yeah. Welcome to America. Yeah. Then they were put in these conditions. So a room uh, that, that normally would hold uh, 50 or, yeah, held 200 or more. They were, these bunks were three high. The, the, the conditions were so bad that they rioted multiple times for better conditions. Mm. Even the commissioner came in there. And so you waited and people waited anywhere from two weeks to 18 months was the record because you had to take a test and you had to pass immigration. You fail the test, you get deported. And this is the sad part, George, right? Um, if some people when they're deported, yeah, I think you know the, the concept of face, right? You don't want to lose face by going home and having somebody spend all this money on you and you get nothing. Absolutely, yep. Yep. Some some people chose to commit suicide oh, yeah. because they didn't want to face the shame. 10% of people out of uh, 2 million were turned away. So 200,000 people either faced the shame or, or took action. And it turned, so basically what my grandfather didn't know when he bought this thing was that it turned into a life or death game. Wow. Uh, luckily for him, uh, he made it. Wow. And he got this. This is the glory. This is the immigration papers right here. This is what you need. This was his ticket into America. Look, he was admitted as a merchant's son. You see that? I see that. Yep. I do yeah. See that. So that's how he got in. Uh, he went to, he only knew two English words, 
talk about George, your, your experience about feeling uncomfortable. He oh, is yeah. now, he's about 21, maybe 22 years old. He has now come to a whole nother country, doesn't speak the language, and he only knows two words, Sioux Sun City, and he has to figure out how to get there. Uber doesn't exist yet. Yeah, right. No, yeah, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, this, here's, the, here's the kind of stories, by the way, too, that I think we need to put ourselves into, because if we can put ourselves into these, then we can understand more of what's going on. So I, 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 this, is, this, is, this is a fascinating story. I mean, there's tragedy and great, great grief in here, but I, I'm, I'm really enjoying learning about this, John, so thank you. He worked for a dollar a week for the army. He paid back 75 cents in room and boards, but he saved up over the course of five years, 40 gold nuggets and coins. He went back to his village. He risked leaving the country. Wow. He, he risked leaving the country, went back to his village, got a matchmaker because that's what was culturally appropriate then. And this here is my grandmother, mm. uh, Mei Lai Jin, otherwise known as Baba to us. Mm. And listen to what she had to do. She left her family in China and everything that she knew about as a very young uh, woman here came to America with some dude <laughs> and tried to <laughs> make a new yep. life. Yep. Yep. And this is what they did. They, they grew five kids. They, my grandfather only had a third grade education. He, he had a gardening business. He eventually had a grocery store. Uh, he ended up owning two properties and wow. these five kids are all college graduates. Wow. Uh, Uncle Bill is a doctor, and one is a PhD in nuclear physicist at the Lawrence Livermore Lab. My goodness. And this is my mom here on the bottom right. Uh, bless her soul. She's not with us anymore. But I wouldn't be here, George, talking to you yeah. without uh, my grandfather going through this story mm. because that's, you know, that's how we got here. And that's what a paper sun is. And that's why I'm thankful every day that I'm here. My grandpa, I tell in my, my Boeing class, right? I tell mm. people, I hope that the spirit of uh, adventure and entrepreneurism is here and leadership and teamwork. It took a team for my mm. grandfather to get here, by the way. It didn't, he didn't do it by himself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it takes to get here. And I, that, that story influences my life every day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I can understand why that's a powerful story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, John. You're welcome. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a little, um, you know, I, I feel, I feel a little bit sense of, I, 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 I'm humbled by that, that story because, uh, because I know, again, this is where, you know, we talk about white privilege as kind of like a matter of, you know, my story that I have, it's ancestors that go back, that came over on some boat and it's just kind of whatever. And they came here and just, and there was, there was nothing like these challenges there, even back then too. Uh, not even talking about today and what's happening today too. So um, I appreciate you sharing that. That's, that's powerful. That's very powerful. Um, uh, let me, um, um, let me ask this question here. Um, what do you, um, uh, why, why do you think there is Asian racism, first of all? Oh, geez. Why yeah. is there racism at all, right? Well, why do that? Of course, of course, yeah. Now, now there is one part that's easy, right? Okay, so George, you also know, right? We're, and you've read the book Blink. Yep. As, peop as people, we're judgy. That's it. Oh, yeah, we are. Everybody is. We're, we're all judgy, right? Meaning that we make snap judgments all the time about people. Yep. But the fact that we're making them about Things we have no control over, color, right? right. You know, uh, yeah. orientation, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, especially, and now let's just even talk about the, the, the hidden ones like mental, right? Like Absolutely. stuttering, which, which was, was on, you know, and just, yep. um, yep. Absolutely. I think it comes though, ra racism though is really about, I don't know, is it prejudging somebody before you get to know them? Because mm -hmm. that's, I really try hard not to do that. I mean, all of us still do some mm -hmm. version of it, sure. right? I think yeah. we've all caught ourselves when we go to places and you're like, you either lock your doors. You, I think, I don't know, maybe that's just safety though. That, that it, it just depends. Yeah. I think what racism happens is when you take a belief that's not actually really true. Mm. And so I think there's that piece. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a secondary piece where people... I think you and I do a lot of personal development work. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. people, whether they look successful on the outside or not, yeah. don't feel powerful. And so they seek other ways mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. be powerful. And, mm -hmm. and I don't, I think these are, most of these are unnecessary, but, and again, feeling powerful by putting other people down. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think so too. I, well, I, I'm thinking about I'm, I, what, you, what you talked about here reminded me of behavior styles. And I know uh, from a, from a pure kind of man, male perspective, yeah. that, uh, that when sometimes I'm around other men and I can sense very clearly 
that if you can't do controller, you're not really a man. All right. And that and that doesn't matter. I mean, that's 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 like even like a this is like me with other with other older white men, if you will, you know, uh, like so. In other words, because I don't have that behavior style preference, I'm not somehow enough like enough of whatever you think that is, right? And so it's so to me, I think even at, even at a level like that, if, if if bias exists, then of course you're going to find some ways to, to to chop that up, to find ways to to filter that into all kinds of different areas. You know, whether it's racial, whether it's gender, whether it's height, whether it's weight, whether it's speech ability, whatever my education level, whatever. You know, and I I I, I mean, this 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 is one thing I love to I love I love telling people. Okay, so as you know, John, like too, I'm, I'm the CEO of the of the Effectiveness Institute. Yeah. But see, one of the things I love about my life story is that I was a janitor at a college, out of high school. Out of high school, I was a janitor. What? I don't even know this story. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What? And for me, that was like, and that was like, for that year and a half, I was a janitor. For me, that was like the grounding foundation for what great leadership is, right there. Mm. Because if you can't understand that level of humanity, you cannot lead people authentically, genuinely, sincerely, and deeply unless you can get down to that level of who we are as people. Yeah, you know, the, the racism here, let's, I love Beth. She said, uh, Beth Maher said, John, yes, the, the need for power as a reason. Um, you know, the racism too, the anti-Asian racism is growing right now. And and for instance, I think, I hope uh, people have seen that in San Francisco, there was a, a, a nice restaurant that was in a resort near there. And this guy goes on a, a pretty severe Asian rant, oh, yeah, turns out to be the CEO of a company. So this is not about education. No, education is not fixing no. the problem. Right. No. Um, and he, had, he and, had a lot of power. He had a lot of power. Oh, he had. So, yeah. And so he goes so, off on this yeah. rant and uh, the woman that I actually really appreciated. So we're talking about allies here. There was a woman who is a waitress in that restaurant and she stepped in and she goes, that is not allowed here. You get out. Right. Yes. And, I, yeah. It, yeah. and I took the time to call that restaurant and tell them thanks. I said, like, I've been watching a lot of the stuff that's happening. And I said, that was one of the like uh, boldest and bravest things that I said, I just want to make the take the time to tell you. And they said they, they've got hundreds of calls and other weird gifts and things cool showing up. But um, this other resource, the Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Center. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Just literally, I'm looking over here, is uh, just released a press release yesterday. This is a guy, he's a professor uh, of cultural studies at San Francisco. And he put up this website in March 19th and that he's measured now. It has received over 2,583 incidents since March, growing at a faster rate, sometimes between 20 to 40 a day. And that's only the ones reported. What about all the ones that are not oh, yeah, reported? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, that to me is like the cry out. People, we got to pay attention. We got to do things now. We've got to stop this. We've got to address anytime you see anything like this going on at all. We got to step in there and do something and make sure and don't call 911. Don't call the police. Okay. I mean, if obviously if there's something terrible going on, call the police. But if you can just step in there right now and do something to stop it, stop it. Yeah. But what, what I mean by that is don't call 911 because there's an Asian person walking, you know, down your down your sidewalk looking at your house. Don't call 911 for that. No. But but I'm, if there's something wrong going on, step in and do something, right? Yeah, George, I think what you're trying to say too is that. I mean, there were, no matter, we love our police. They yes, still take that time to respond from getting from here to there. Yes. And when these things happen, every second counts. Absolutely. I totally agree. Every Absolutely. second. It's yeah. like, you know, the equivalent of a heart attack. If you wait, you know, four and five, seven minutes for, for the paramedics to arrive in a, uh, in a heart yeah. attack, that person's most likely not going to make it. Exactly. And, exactly. and in racism, every second that this thing goes on yeah. is, uh, and that you, you might be observing, it's like you're almost allowing it to go on. You know, I have given some guidelines around this too. I mean, obviously, if there's a weapon involved, you, you don't want to get in between no. that. Like, it's not not worth that. But yeah. there are plenty of things that you can do. And my two big things are are this: turn your camera on. When I walk around and I sense that something might be going on, oh yes, I get my camera. Out. I was in Bellevue, George. Your 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 office yeah. city. All right. And I was just finishing something near the library. And by the way, Bellevue is not really known to be, you know, right. a hate town. But I was there and a guy, a, a teenage kid I'm walking by, comes out and pulls out this ching chong, cha ching, ching chong, cha chong. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Goodness gracious. Are you kidding me? 
Right. And so I, so I, I immediately, this is my training, right? Yep. My training is like, yep. how, you need to remember what to do in the moment. I immediately yes. unconsciously pull out my phone, hit record and I can go, excuse me. What'd you say? Mm -hmm. You know what he did? Hmm. He turned and ran. Oh, sure. Yep. And guess who gets, he had a friend. His friend was African American. And I'm like, dude, who is your friend? Are you kidding me? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I walked to, and I kept, I walked, I walked at least two full solid blocks trying to keep up with him, trying to see if I get a face shot of him. Right? And that's the funny part when most of the time when you, you face racism straight up, when it's again, it's yeah. not dangerous, not like a weapon or something. Yeah. Most people run because they don't expect that. They expect, they expect you sure. to not do anything or ignore. Yeah. And when somebody takes action, they don't know what to do. No, right? And right. so, so the worst part is then I stopped filming. I came back around the corner, right? In the library. I'm trying to walk back to my car now thinking it's over. Uh, I, I, I hear a yell. I turn around. He throws a rock. It's like this big. He throws a rock at me. Luckily, it only hit, you know, stopped at my feet. But the fact that he actually threw a rock at me. Oh, my gosh. This yeah. is Bellevue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so, so anyway, so it, the number one is, is uh, your camera. Number two is report. Uh, people do track this, whether it's the stop AAPI, uh, the police actually carry, you know what, and, and listen to me, even me, after all my education, I'm like, I didn't get a clear shot of his face, so I'm not going to bug the Bellevue police. When I posted it online, though, yeah. I had three or four people come tell me going, no, 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 you should actually give that to the Bellevue police because they can recognize people by clothes and body shape mm. and as extra parts. And so I actually took the action a week or so afterwards to give it to Bellevue I'm not sure if it amounted to anything, but I didn't even I didn't think of doing that. So. Well, that's good though. That's good and a great tip. I, I, I everybody listening to, I encourage you the same thing too. So if you if you think you're if you've seen something going on that you're so wait, there's something about this is distance that you seem right. Turn the camera on. I totally agree with you. I've done that a couple of times too as well, and it's just amazing how it changes everything. It just changes everything. So I actually was afraid of getting attacked one time because you know I think somebody was upset at me because I'm I am an older white guy and I understand why people have emotion around that. I get that totally. This guy was wanting to, I think, was attack me because of that. I turned my camera on, like, I'm not doing anything here. I'm not doing anything wrong at all. So what you're doing is not appropriate right now at all. I'm actually here to support and be a part of this. So, and it stopped immediately. So I thought, okay. So that, of course, that was a little self-protective. But like you said, still turn the camera on whatever you see something going on because, uh, yeah. Let the, let the world judge. That's what that's what I think the, 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 the change of all these cameras and the power of live casting and social media is that it's coming unfiltered. Let the world judge what was happening, uh, you know, at least on the initial pace. And of course, you know, if it gets to the law, you're going to have to do that. But but the world will judge very quickly yeah. in terms of that. And I think um, those parts are, are important. I, I think that is one of the, I, I think it's one of the best ways, because, again, if you capture it right, people can make their own judgments about whether you think it's OK or not. And after yeah. that, then it's on you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's do this. Anybody have any questions? Uh, again, there, that's an open time here, but if you have any questions, send those to us right now. I know that John and I both would love to hear your questions uh, to answer those. So let us know about that too as well. Um, you mentioned the camera thing. Was there anything else you'd suggest that we, we do, John? Anything else we could be mindful of? Could be yeah, helpful? again, again, the, the, the website um, again is uh, stop AAA, uh, AAPI. That's for Asian American Pacific Islander hate. Uh, and they're actually apparently moving to a new site. But uh, again, that's a big piece uh, around it. Um, we also and, did in the chat, by the way, we did post uh, your blog post down that you wrote. So again, if, if you want to click on that link in chat, you can go up there, you can go to our website and find it there. Uh, and you mentioned that as well. You mentioned that resource there as well, too. So let me add this. So uh, again, Hong and I have, are, are great friends. Uh, he has an amazing restaurant, uh, too. Uh, he said, I wish there where, were more. Where, where is it? What's up? Where's his restaurant? Oh, uh, geez, uh, King Donuts, I believe, if I got it right, Hong. Oh. I visited the location. It's in on Rainier Avenue. Uh, it's a little it bit before. South Seattle. I'll check um, it out. Okay, cool. He said, I wish more people in this country were as close to their family's immigration story. But this is a good one, George. I think that what we're discussing here is racism at the individual behavior level, which is overt racism. Mm -hmm. Then there's an institutionalized and systemic racism. Yeah. So let me make a comment. And I love George's piece on that. So institutionalized mm -hmm. and, and systemic are things that are through, in, uh, you know, large institutions, meaning sometimes companies. Mm -hmm. 
right? Sometimes companies are doing this and sometimes they're not even conscious or aware of it. And that's where I think not getting promoted into key pieces of leadership come in. Um, you know, institutionalized also is this law, right? An anti-Asian law, a Chinese immigration act is stuff that that are doing. And so, uh, and I really need to call out that I do believe that the the connection between using the word Kung flu or Chinese China virus right now is adding to the Asian American uh, challenges of which many of us, I don't know, people, you know, people, if you see or heard other people, they're like, go home. And so, you know, our response for those, most of us who are on here are like, okay, I'm home now. What do I do? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is like, so people are taking this and saying that we're to fault or to blame. And I'm like, I, I wasn't in Wuhan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And who knows what even really happened there? We don't even really know. I mean, so that's just it. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah. All, all that is, all that is just such a grief and it's so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have to go on about how wrong that all is, because hopefully everybody listening today knows that and recognizes that too as well. But uh, but yeah, to your point about that, when you when you see something, when you capture something, to, to share that, to increase your awareness about it, to be more mindful of these things, really helpful to do that too as well. So we got to do more of that as well too. So um, um, yeah, and watching the language too. So that's a big one. Um, so George, well, let me see if we can get into it. Yeah, systemic what is racism. No, institutionalizing and systemic racism. Yeah. I mean, because it is a bigger problem. So, I mean, what well, have you yeah. seen or what what do you think can be done there? Well, that's a, that's a great question. So I will go and share with you. I do happen to know someone, uh, an African-American uh, uh, man who is on the police commission of Seattle. Uh, terrific, amazing individual, good friend with him, treasure him uh, greatly. He uh, has advised me, he's acknowledged that certainly most of the policemen know in many police departments around the country that reform is necessary. Yeah. Many yeah. police officers know that. They're not opposed to reform at all because they know changes need to be made. But they also know, like many of us who, who are aware, who watch like say the 13th, the movie, we know that the incarceration issue is huge in this country, that the police issue is related to the judicial system, which is related to the prison system. So we have to be able to address those things. And that doesn't even talk about real estate and finance, whatever, all kinds of other issues that are there, zoning laws, things like that. But we have to certainly at least begin to start now to do more to address. And I think that's starting to happen. But we need to do a lot more to address those issues there. They're systemic in the cultures of, in the, in the places where it's allowed and tolerated. Uh, again, in the police system, in the, uh, in the court system, in the prison systems. Uh, because obviously, uh, you, you watch these movies, it's very clear in there that yeah. we simply have a severe problem with systemic racism. And of course, that's primarily black and white, but there are many other places too that you've talked about here that it's relevant too. So not just there. Those, well, just, those are just a few examples. There's more than that. But My good friend, Matt Deeds is on here. Uh, thank you for your service. He's a uh, retired army. He grew up as a, a, the the Caucasian boy in Hawaii. And by the way, oh. that's not easy. <laughs> no, no, that's um, true. Howley, Howley, we call that, right? That's right. That's right. And, and here in Seattle, he says, you know, Seattle's police force has taken many, many steps to be more progressive, especially after the WTA. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that Seattle's police force has really yeah. done a lot of really positive actions over the years. It, this is just such a challenging time. I hope they continue. You know, that's there's we don't even know what's about to happen no. um, with that. But I do believe that one piece here in the institutionalized and systemic racism, uh, especially for all those either who are allies or people of color, um, is you got to get on some of these boards and leadership positions. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have gotten seats and tables in places that I certainly did not feel like I belong. Mm. Right. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and so, and, and I said yes to them because I don't think there's the, the only way to really start changing something is from the inside. And so if you get invited in for whatever reason, yeah. right that you should get in there and really uh, see if you can get in and make change. Now it's gonna be difficult, don't get me wrong, you might be the only one, but there's only one better way to attempt. It's so much easier from the inside than the outside. Yeah, yeah, well, I think I think what you're talking about too is there's a lot of fear. Uh, in, fact, in fact, Kimberly just made, made a comment about that too. Tremendous amount of fear, false events appearing real. I know, uh, look at Kimberly, yes. Great acronym for that too, um, that's there as well. And uh, And I think also part of it is there's a lot of fear. I, I know that uh, for myself, for example, I've always I've always uh, felt passionate about racism in terms of passionate about how wrong it was, uh, passionate about the knowledge that I have it inside of me, but I have implicit bias. 
Um, not knowing exactly what that always was, but trying to become more aware and learn about that. But I think that requires you to address your own fear, the fear that it's there inside of you, the fear that you might know what to say, the fear you might say the wrong thing, but, but overcome the fear to say, yes, but I need to, I need to, I want to do things to engage to try to overcome that fear. And I think, I think some, I, I want to say that 30% number I talked about earlier of people that are actually engaging and trying to do anything at all about racism, that number is so small. I think some of those people that are not in that 30%, that other 70%, I think some of them are afraid. And what I would say is face your fear, step forward, do something, try to engage in some way because this is not gonna get better unless we face the fears we have and start to move into them. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking primarily to other whites, okay? Face the fear you have. So I think this, George, will give the guidance that I've been giving ever since coronavirus started, which is people, which is fail faster. Yeah. yeah. Right. And and so I understand, right. I'm that guy, which is like, if you yell at me that I didn't empty the dishwasher, I may never do it again. But what I'm yeah. saying is that that is like, push through that fail yeah. faster. I'd rather have you and hear you fail at something because yeah. eventually you're going to find a piece of success. Yeah. And once you find that success, I think you'll find what it is that you get from, you know, from contribution, from giving from something where you're not expecting anything in return, but if something great happens, you know, everybody here that is listening or watching, each of you has particular gifts and skills. And I hope that you can apply them to this problem because it is a problem. Yes, and if you could just make it better, even make it better in your small space or wherever oh, that is, absolutely. Uh, fail, yeah. fail faster. And the second thing that really I can, I can get on with, like, if you don't, if you can't decide what to do, uh, we have this really cool coalition that we got going on, George, right now. We only have two tenets to this. So it's kind of called the common sense coalition. And it's basically register people to vote. Every Eventbrite registration program that I'm putting out there has a free link to register to vote. And the second thing that we're doing is just educating people about the issues and your candidates. Vote. Fantastic. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, well, I, I know we're just about out of time, but I want to, I want to say, first of all, I'm going to make sure I, I, I let you know, John, thank you for coming on. Thank you for spending the time with me. Thank you for sharing the stories, your thoughts, your observations. Um, I appreciate your willing to take a step forward and kind of do this as well. So kudos to you. Thank you uh, for that. I, everybody here attending, I, I want to say for them as well, too. Thanks for that. Your story about Paper Sun, that was educational for me. So I appreciate that. Um, and uh, for taking the time to do this. Um, and we're, we're gonna have more conversations too as well about this. I know just talking a little bit about the behavior style model again, and you talked about the stabilizer analyzer preference. Uh, one of my uh, one of my good friends who I've worked with, you know her, Colleen Yaku uh, Yamaguchi. Yes. She works with EDI. Yes. And Colleen may be a guest, I hope, I hope so sometime in time, I hope she'll be a guest as well. On Get this. her. But she was the one that was that talked to me a little about my unconscious bias about that too, that I was aware of. Oh my goodness. So she caught me on that too. You know, it's uncomfortable sometimes. But that's okay. Be willing to be uncomfortable because you're not going to learn unless you're uncomfortable, right? We all know that. That's just pure leadership skills and strengths. So, so anyway, so thank you, John. Thank you for those that were attending today. I appreciate that. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. And just one more time, just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for joining in. Thank you for being a part of the conversation. We appreciate that. And um, let me go ahead and uh, close this out here with a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a thank you very uh, much. So, George, comments? let me let me say the last word here, if you don't mind. No, you bet. By all means, have the last word, George. Thank you for having these conversations. Thank you for taking the time of uh, taking an idea into reality. Uh, thank you for being part of this 30%. You are doing something, right? And, and thank you for furthering the, the conversation. And what I said, use the resources you have. This is you. This is your platform. This is your company. It's what you stand for. Uh, and I appreciate that. Find your way, whoever you are. But George, this is your way. I really appreciate you taking time and energy to do this. And, and again, this is really, I've seen George, I've watched George. George really cares about this conversation. That alone is one of the, the best parts. So not only the, uh, the action, but the way that you take those actions. And so uh, please, any of you think about how you can help either amplify or share or make a friend, right? Of Absolutely. other people. There you go. Uh, there you go. George, you've been one of my friends over the years. Thank you so much. And the only part I can do is teach you, of course, to say goodbye in Chinese. You know how to do that? Uh, let's see, I do. Zaijian? Zaijian. Zaijian. There we go. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. We'll see you got next it. time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend, y'all. Keep, keep fighting a good fight here, all right? We'll see you later. <laughs>